So to kick off this new series, I interview my friend Joshua Stevens. He's a professional ultra runner. Joshua, or Josh, has a fascinating background, not only because he's a pre-competitive runner, but also because he spent several years with the U.S. Army, had multiple deployments in the Middle East, and after coming back to the U.S., he struggled with opiate addiction. He found in running a way not only to cope with that, but also overcome those struggles. So we're going to talk more about that in the conversation. We're also going to talk about this crazy challenge that he recently did, in which he ran 24 hours on a treadmill. Uh, he did that to raise awareness uh, for opiate addiction. He's an ambassador for this organization called the Heron Project. So we're also going to talk more about that. So. I hope that you like this first edition of the Addictive Conversations with Joshua Stevens. If you have any questions, feedback, I would love to hear from you, okay? Because I want to keep improving. I want to put out content that you guys find useful and inspirational. You can reach out to me at digdeepboco at gmail.com or send me a direct message on Instagram. Hope that you like the Addictive Conversations. All right. I'm so excited. First edition of the Dig Deep Conversations. I'm really pumped to introduce you to my good friend, Joshua Stevens. Hey, man. Hey, brother. Thanks yeah. for having me on. Thank you very much. So we're here at the Boulder Running Company. Why? Because we are not only friends, but also co-workers here. Joshua is the master guru in all things uh, trail and ultra running shoes and gear. So whenever you're in town, just be sure to stop by and visit him. Look at this. <laughs> I came up with my list of things, so we're going we're gonna to kick this off. Tell us a little bit about yourself. You grew up, you have a really, really strong background, impressive background in the Army as well. Um, and how did you get into trail and ultra running? Sure. Um, well, I grew up in New England uh, on the coast of Maine uh, predominantly, and that's where I did my schooling. Uh, and then in 1989, I first enlisted. Okay. in the Army and uh, had done okay on some testing, so they uh, they thought that maybe I wasn't reaching my full potential as a uh, private in the infantry, so I had the opportunity to uh, attend uh, the University of Maine for my undergraduate work mm -hmm. and uh, was in the ROTC program uh, and uh, continued uh, being involved in sport. I wasn't... Uh, uh, you know, historically a runner. I think I competed once in okay. cross country in, in my freshman year in high school. Okay. I went over to soccer, but nice. uh, really, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I, I was definitely never the the fastest or strongest or biggest kid. I was pretty little. Is that the reason why you like uh, Diego Maradona? Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> we both agree that Diego Armando Maradona yeah. is the greatest soccer yeah. player in the history of sports the, of, of soccer, I guess. So. <laughs> The pride of Argentina. Very, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, awesome. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, through that process, I continued you know, to be involved in sport, and uh, I think it was an outlet for me to uh, continue to push myself and to achieve and to try to do more than people uh -huh. expected of me. And then the Army was really a, another kind of extension of that. It was a great vehicle, which is a very, uh, you know, it's a very focused meritocracy where you can achieve uh, whatever uh, you want so long as you're willing to put in the time and the effort. And, um, and so I really kind of enjoyed <coughs> that environment. And I spent the next... In 24, well, 24 years from 1989, but through mm. the next 20 years or so in... Uh, multiple deployments? Sure, yeah. Um, multiple global deployments um, uh, throughout the 90s and the 2000s. Wow, that's impressive. Yeah, I was, uh, I was reading more about your background. I mean, thank you very much for your service. Oh, I really appreciate honor. it. It was a privilege. So, yeah, I, uh, I uh, was uh, first uh, wounded in combat operations in Iraq in 2005 uh, as a result of uh, improvised explosive device in uh, a town called Beji, Iraq, in mm -hmm. uh, northern Salah Adin province. And uh, that resulted in uh, a, a break in my cervical spine and some ruptured discs. Mm -hmm. uh, 
which was the first time I ever became exposed to um, opiate mm -hmm. pain medication. Uh, and I like to think that up until that point, I'd led a, uh, uh, you know, a pretty uh, mindful life and, and hadn't, uh, you know, I'd never grown up really exposed to drugs or, uh, you know, excessive alcohol use. Mm. Uh, and uh, that became uh, a crutch initially to uh, you know, mitigate the physical pain and to keep me uh, you know, actively in my profession. Uh, it's oftentimes, <clears throat> I like the, the comparison to working at the elite level in the United States Army uh, as to uh, professional athletes in terms of uh, there's a robust <clears throat> infrastructure to keep you on the field. Yeah. Uh, so I had, you know, well-meaning uh, and well-qualified medical practitioners that would uh, do everything within their power to keep you in the game. And, and, and this was at a very high operational tempo time globally with Iraq and Afghanistan, and we were, you know, deploying every mm. year, essentially. So to suffer, uh, you know, a fairly catastrophic injury <clears throat> and, you know, really gave you just two choices. It's fairly binary. You can either um, choose to take yourself out and leave your teammates short mm -hmm. or do whatever it takes in order to continue to, to compete at that level. So. Uh, that's how opiates found their way into my life. <clears throat> uh, you know, one of the areas that, pardon me, <clears throat> that I didn't realize until much later was uh, another insidious component of opiates is their uh, physiological and, and chemical uh, capacity to numb emotional pain. So as the uh, wars in Iraq and Afghanistan drug on, uh, I was not acknowledging or treating um, post-traumatic stress disorder mm -hmm. symptoms uh, or root causes. I uh, had uh, suffered traumatic brain injury uh, from uh, you know, multiple exposures to IED incidents. Uh, and of course, I was continuing to numb the physical pain mm -hmm. with, uh, with uh, very uh, powerful um, prescription medications right. that ranged the gamut from fentanyl to Dilaudid to Percocet. Uh, this continued on uh, and I had my first cervical spinal surgery at Walter Reed in 2008 mm -hmm. and then a, uh, a second at uh, Wilmack Army Medical Center at Fort Bragg in 2011 and, I, and at that point I was you know six years into heavy use of prescription pain medication and I was no longer just using it as prescribed I was had been abusing it for quite some time mm -hmm. uh, and it is a uh, uh, unbelievably nefarious drug in the sense that uh, uh, you're allowed to you, you addicts become tremendously adept liars uh, and they uh, become very good at, at lying to themselves and one of the dangers of opiates is so long as there's a professional providing it to you mm -hmm. there's a rationale or a justification in your mind right. that uh, well I'm just I'm just doing what uh, a professional has told me to do right. um, and uh, yeah, it, that was a you know that was a dark uh, path. It becomes uh, a completely uh, isolating and obsessive lifestyle, where the only uh, concern uh, that you wake with and go to bed with at night is where am I going to get <coughs> right. my next you know pain pill? Right. So that uh, you know that that path really only goes a couple of places. And uh, it was, uh, it took a toll, uh, you know, significant toll on my family. It cost me a marriage. Um, it cost me uh, probably progressing further into the military had I not been uh, so severely injured and 
uh, you know, just unable to cope with the demands of that kind of lifestyle um, with, you know, again, untreated PTSD, mm -hmm. um, marginally treated traumatic brain injury, and they've come a long ways. It, you know, they didn't have, uh, you know, many of the uh, methodologies of treatment and therapy that they have today. Uh, and as I became uh, close to retirement, you know, as that, that approached, I uh, really had to come face to face with myself. Mm -hmm. And in my early 40s, uh, you, you, uh, uh, as the great, uh, the tennis great Martina Navratilova says, what really choices do you have? You either compete or you quit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've never been a quitter. Uh, I've never been the fastest or the strongest or the biggest, uh, but I've also never been a quitter. Mm -hmm. uh, so <clears throat> the first step was to get clean. Uh, and when we, when we talk a little bit further uh, here in a moment about the Heron Project, uh, one of the reasons that raising money for treatment and support for addiction uh, is that I didn't feel that I had that. There was still a lot of uh, uh, misunderstanding and ignorance surrounding mm -hmm. addiction, uh, uh, you know, even within family circles and friend circles. Of course. Uh, right. uh, it was still largely perceived as a moral failing rather than this uh, disease. So I uh, locked myself in a room for seven days. And, what? Uh, yeah, my uh, guest room. Okay. Yeah, and uh, if anyone's familiar with uh, getting clean from heroin, uh, withdrawal is one of yeah. just the most horrific experiences. Uh, and uh, I didn't have any of the medications that can help alleviate that. I, uh, I you know, believe there was a 96 hour period in which I didn't sleep. Uh, uh, and I came out of that with a couple of basic understandings. One is uh, I never want to relapse because I never want to go through that again. <laughs> uh, but moreover, there's got to be a better way for people who have unwittingly fallen into this trap right. to gain not only uh, the medical support and resources, but family support and right. love and, and uh, understanding to, to climb out of that, that hole. So it's, it's, uh, wow. it's pretty tough to That's get out. That's pretty hardcore. You know, recovering from surgeries and, uh, and, and addiction uh, left me uh, hanging around a lot. I watched a lot of TV, yeah. uh, read a lot of books, uh, you know, had a lot, quite a bit of time for reflection. But I've always had in the back of my mind this fear that once I was done with the army there would be this uh, massive void in my life. I think I've always tried to pursue uh, activities, adventures, and endeavors that challenge me both mentally and physically. Uh, you know, I'd been a, a pretty prolific diver for a number <laughs> of years, had gotten into cave diving and exploration yeah. and mapping. and. Uh, open ocean, deep open ocean, wreck diving. Uh, of course, I'd had the Army, uh, having been a ranger and served in you know, a number of uh, Army Special Operations Forces units in my career. Uh, and by complete chance, I watched the uh, movie uh, Unbreakable. Oh my God, the, no the, way. The, yeah, yeah. Really, the, the that's what made you think of? It is, and it's, it comes full circle. It's a great, um, so for the people who don't know about the movie, sorry man, <laughs> yeah, Unbreakable is this documentary that um, kind of, um, um, it's about the Western States 100. It follows four ultra runners. Um, and it's basically their story, the days before and during the race and after the race is awesome. Um, yeah, it's one of my favorite movies. Yeah, yeah. I, I really interestingly was, uh, had a chance to uh, catch up with Tony Kropischka at the yeah. uh, Ultimate Direction Christmas party last yeah. week. Uh, and I had shared with him that you know I was 44, and I wasn't sure what I was going to do uh, with the next chapter in my life. I yeah. watched that movie, and I <laughs> and I told him uh, I said you know you inspired me to move into this 
career, yep. this profession, and <laughs> he. He laughed. He said, well, you must have been disappointed at the end of the movie. Oh, my God. I thought it was like, absolutely awesome. not. So Tony Kuprichka, Anton Kuprichka is a crazy, badass ultra runner. He lives in Boulder, Colorado, and he was one of the uh, main characters in this documentary. Yeah, just uh, an extraordinary uh, mountain endurance athlete and uh, two-time Leadville champion. So... Uh, yeah, I, I watched that movie, and uh, you know, I probably, uh, well, I've never really been accused of moderation or being uh, <laughs> reasonable, uh, and I and I thought, man, I'd like to, I'd like to do that. I had no idea if I'd physically be able to do it, or uh, if uh, I, you know, was too old or yeah. whatnot. And I ran. Uh, my first ultra distance on my uh, 44th birthday when I was uh, living and training in Asheville, North Carolina mm -hmm. with a local runner there and uh, ran the uh, Art Loeb Trail, which is a th about, about a 50K distance um, trail with a ton of, uh, ton of gain and it's pretty challenging. So when do you start running actually? Like, so sure, well I've always uh, run. I mean, I'm, I mean ultra, like so you, you were saying, uh, is that like four years ago? Uh, so 2017, I mean, really only three years ago. Three, okay, so this is crazy. <laughs> this guy has won um, one of the most um, competitive, really, uh, 100Ks here in the state of Colorado. It's called the Bear Chase. So there's different distances. The guy won it last year. So he's been running for only three years, and he's already winning stuff. Um, and then I think you finished top five in the Rocky Raccoon 15-miler. Yeah, sure, yeah, sure did. Dude, that's just <laughs> insane. I just need to get some anyway, advice from him <laughs> how to win stuff. Because I did the, the, the Bear Chase 50K this year, and it took me seven hours. So anyway, <laughs> that's awesome. It's about, it's about being out there. <clears throat> it's about being out there, man. And yeah. That's, uh, you know, one of the great things about what you're doing with Dig Deep, and one of the things I love about... Colorado yeah and Coloradans and and the athletes out here uh, yeah no matter how fast you are or good you are all you got to do is just turn around and there's someone faster or better or stronger oh in yeah th in this town I mean it's uh, it's so motivational yeah that's true oh for for yeah for real yeah I remember when I first moved here went up uh, on this uh, hilly um, Right, um, and then I was just doing my thing, feeling like Lance Armstrong, and then there's this 75-year-old guy just passed me by, just like nothing. So <laughs> it was it was crazy. How did you get involved with the Heron Project? Yeah, so I really had uh, been treating uh, portions of my life in a compartmentalized way. It was pretty linear. There was running. Uh, there was uh, recovery. You know, they're my kids. I mean, they're, you know, and I, I, I essentially, I think as a byproduct of how you have to be uh, in the military, particularly, you know, in, in combat situations, you have to be able to seal off certain uh, feelings and emotions, uh, not in a sense of being an automaton. You, you know, you never lose your morality or your ethical compass, but you, you have to be able to be laser focused on mm. a, a certain tasks. In 2000, it would have been um, 16, uh, I, I guess, yeah, I was at the uh, uh, American Trail Runner Association conference in Estes Park, and uh, I had met David Clark briefly on a book tour uh, by and who's David oh, Clark? Oh, David Clark yeah David is uh, uh, an Amer uh, an, uh, you know an amazing American uh, inspirational story uh, he had uh, written the book out there David was a former 320 pound alcoholic and drug addict mm -hmm. who had uh, essentially lost a multi-million dollar business and uh, wow. through I, I wouldn't say predominantly because there's never one thing, but through endurance athletics, mm -hmm. he reinvented himself. Mm -hmm. uh, and, he, and he's just a, an amazing, amazing character. Uh, the first guy that had kind of led me to meeting uh, David Clark is uh, Charlie Engel. Yeah. And uh, Charlie is a, a good friend of mine and, and has been 
uh, a great mentor and inspiration to me. Uh, yeah, he's so great. I, I, I learned about Charlie, the first time I learned about Charlie is when I watched the running uh, through his hair. Yeah, or yeah, no. yeah. I watched the movie, I have that <laughs> movie on DVD. I watched that so many times. You know, to, to speak of, you know, what Charlie did for me, just a quick anecdote was the first real, like, national uh, uh, ultra that I ran was the um, Badwater Cape Fear 50 miler All on right. the East Coast. <laughs> and uh, that's where I met uh, the great Pete Kosselnick, who broke the Transcon record last year. Wow. He's a two time Badwater champion, uh, course record holder. Uh, so it's a 50 mile race that's part of the Badwater series, and it's the East Coast uh, portion of the series. Uh, so 50 miler, 38, 39 of it's on, on the beach. Oh a, my God! This is a challenge. <laughs> and, okay. Uh, so I, I had uh, <clears throat> again to completely inexperienced, maybe the third ultra I'd ever run. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'd, I'd done pretty well. Was in uh, was in fourth place up to about forty six miles. And uh, at, at at mile forty six, uh, the challenge with being on the beach was you could never get away from anybody. Yeah. No matter how well you were running, you could always see who was in front of you, and the person behind you could always oh see. Oh man, you. that's gonna be pretty mental. Like, it's, yeah, you know? yeah, it's, it was a grind. Uh, and this great runner from uh, the East Coast named Frank Gonzalez, uh, who is a very experienced uh, and very quality runner, uh, I think probably knew how much of a novice I was. Uh, dropped me at, at mile 46 like I was standing still and and, uh, and, and <laughs> broke my and broke my will uh, you know so you know fast forward a little bit the last four miles were, were pretty uh, were pretty brutal and I got uh, passed by another guy but with a, about a mile and a half left Charlie Engel caught up with me oh, and yeah. uh, he, maybe it was about a mile to go at this point and I was I was gassed. I was it was uh, I was definitely uh, d deep back inside the pain cave at that point. And did you uh, always um, uh, like you know the, the whole idea of like going the distance and physical suffering and yeah. those, those things that we all like, right? You know, we yeah. all love it, right? <laughs> no, I, I did. And and, and 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 just a point about Charlie's character, he he caught up with me and. Uh, I didn't know what he had left. He didn't know what I had left, but uh, he looked over me. Never met me before. I mean, never. The guy didn't know me from from anyone. I'm, I'm nobody. And uh, he uh, said, "Why don't we run this thing in together?" And I was like, "Well, that is uh, that's amazing, uh, amazing sportsmanship and an, an amazing gesture." Uh, so we finished. Uh, uh, I always tease them. They gave him sixth and me seventh, and we yeah. crossed the same time. But uh, <laughs> yeah, no, that was uh, that's where I met Charlie. So through that, fast forward to you know being out here, uh, David Clark uh, and Charlie had done. They participated in the icebreaker okay. run, so that the, the uh, uh, team run across the U.S. to raise awareness for uh, mental health uh, awesome. uh, treatment. Uh, and I met David and uh, at a book tour for Charlie and uh, out in Denver. A few months later, I was at the Otra conference in Estes. Uh -huh. David had a uh, table set up uh, with his book out there, which is an amazing read. And we talked a little bit about what I was doing with my story, or more to the point, what I wasn't doing mm -hmm. uh, and how it wasn't necessarily incumbent of me, but perhaps it was a little bit selfish on my part mm -hmm. for not using trail running, which I was getting some notice for and doing pretty well with, using that as a vehicle to share my story about addiction and really move the ball forward with getting people treatment and support. It's interesting that you mentioned that because I, I, I guess what you were saying, and I'm thinking for me too, is like trying to um, use what you're doing as part of something that's bigger than just yourself. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, like when I first started Dig Deep, uh, like I just was focused on selling stuff. And then like 
I realized little by little that you know people really love to be part of this community, uh, be part of something that's bigger than themselves, and they get inspired by, you know, daily quotes that I post and things like that. And that got me thinking, okay, you know, this is something that um, I think is um, it's bigger than just you know trying to make money out of selling stuff. Right. So let's start about uh, let's talk about digging deep um, in general. I guess one of the things that I, I, I get curious about. You know, people, you know, like you who run in a competitive um, way is like, how do you prepare yourself to, you know, dig deep, you know, sure. mentally and physically? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And, and I, th I think it's almost more poignant during training. And as I get older, it's tough to sometimes find that motivation to do the kind of training that's required to perform well at a high level uh, in endurance athletics. Um, I can go back to my childhood and, and being a young man, uh, and I think I've heard this about a number of athletes, is a fear of failing. Uh, I, I'm definitely uh, terrified of the, of the prospect of, of failing, uh, you know, which uh, you know, occurred at Leadville last mm -hmm. year. Uh, uh, I'm a competitor. I've always been competitive. I'm, I'm the oldest of six siblings, uh, you know, brother, a sister, two stepbrothers, and mm -hmm. a half sister, uh, four of those being boys. Uh, uh, so I, I want to win at everything. Right. Uh, so being propelled by f fear of failing and letting people down and this natural instinct to want to be the best that I can be. Uh, gets you a long ways. I would say that the best thing that's happened to me as a professional runner is the uh, bolstering of uh, support from nonprofits like the Heron Project and something right. better. Right. So running for something other than myself, at you know now at age forty-seven, has given me uh, the motivation to get up and grind out yeah. the training and, and to stay consistent right. and to get treatment and to, yeah. uh, and to push forward. It definitely makes it more meaningful, huh? It absolutely does. I don't know that I, don't know that I would do these activities or continue to race uh, you know, for the foreseeable future right. uh, without that kind of uh, inspiration. Awesome. So I'm just curious about the more, more technical, like a more tactical uh, way in the sense like when you have to dig deep, do you have like um, a playlist that you like to listen, you know, <laughs> that you listen? Because I have one, my yeah. iPod, that's yeah. called, uh, uh, well, it used to be called uh, Redline or, or something like that. So I only play it when I really needed to. Yeah. Or, I don't know, a podcast or you have any mantra. Like you're in the middle of that 100 mile race. Okay, you're in yeah. the you know, herd locker, yeah. you want to quit walk us through what's in your mind and how do you keep going? Uh, music, without a doubt. <laughs> That's why I think maybe the Vermont 100 was one of the hardest things I've ever done is because uh, the Vermont 100, which is one of the four yeah. Grand Slam Ultra events, uh, was my first 100 miler. It's still the traditional race where they have both the athletes as well as the horses. So go back to the early oh my Western God. states. No way, really? So you, yeah, you're not allowed to use an iPod or uh -huh. music for safety reasons. Yeah. So being up in my head for 100 miles yeah. is a uh, not always the greatest place to be. <laughs> music without a doubt. Uh, I know some people that listen to podcasts. Uh -huh. uh, I know some people that uh, you know, use mantras or almost a meditative state in running. Uh, I'm definitely more visceral in yeah. terms of music. Yeah. And it's, I, I wish I had something as clever as Redline. I have like playlists that are as uh, <laughs> creative as quiet, yeah. sort of quiet, not quiet, running and running too. I think those are my playlists. Oh, the funny thing that you mentioned that red light thing is that you have that robot voice of the iPod set, red light, it's, 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 it's funny. Awesome, yeah, I do the same thing. Um, I, I, I just, I think that I listen to music actually when, as a treat, and by that I mean like, for instance, I've done a, only one 50 mile, that was a silver rush in Leadville, and I remember thinking, okay, I'm gonna run 50K, 30 right. miles, and my treat's gonna be 
to start listening to music 21. for the last 20. So it was like, okay, so, I was so looking forward to getting to that point because it definitely makes things easier. Yeah. Because I used to like listen to music, music since the very beginning and right. I like it, but for some reason, I don't know, in this kind of long distance things, you know, it makes it more, more special. Okay, one of the reasons why I wanted to kick off this series of uh, conversations with Josh is because he, um, I mean, not only great guy, but he does crazy stuff. Like uh, this weekend, okay, he's gonna run 24 hours on a treadmill here at the Boulder Running Company. He's not gonna run 24 hours just because he w likes to run 24 hours on a treadmill. He's, he's doing it to raise awareness for the Heron Project. So uh, he's gonna encourage people to not only come and you know help him to <laughs> finish it, but also to <laughs> donate. So that's important. Tell us more about um, sure. this project. So last year, uh, David Clark set up this uh, six and 12 and 24 hour uh, treadmill challenge for the Heron Project Ultra Team. Okay. So a number of athletes across the country participated in this. Uh, and I was gonna try to do 24 hours and uh, I, I had no idea what I was getting into. I don't think I'd maybe been on a treadmill in 10 years or, mm. or what have you. Uh, and uh, I was like, oh, what the heck, you know, it's, it'll be my first event for the, the Heron Project, let me get on board. Uh, the night before the event, I went to the treadmill in my fitness center in my apartment complex, ran on it for 10 minutes to make sure it worked. And the next morning got up at 6 a.m. and I did it. Uh, I managed to get uh, about 101 miles uh in 18 hours and 25 <laughs> minutes oh my god and then i was i was cooked i was done is that the i saw one of your photos on facebook where there's like red bull cans and uh yeah. and sure <laughs> pedialyte the light i think yes. cans on, is that yes. that's that awesome. was it that's so awesome. i had done you know no specific training for it i didn't uh really put a lot of thought into it uh and uh it was one i mean it may have been the most challenging run i've ever yeah, done of course uh so this year rolled around and uh, uh, no one was saying anything about the event. Oh like my. Season two wasn't being talked about. Uh, and I contacted Pam McCard, who is the director of THP Runs. Mm -hmm. And I said, I think, you know, uh, this always happens when you've, you know, you've uh, had a great run, you're feeling good. You're like, I think, you know, I think I want to do it again uh, <laughs> this awesome. year. And uh, so, she quickly signed me up and they threw their, their support behind it. And this year I wanted to elevate not only the level of performance, but elevate uh, exposure to the yeah. Heron Project. So again, doing it here yeah. at BRC, having right. the support of Jack Rabbit, Bull Running Company, you know, my sponsors, I Innovate, Steigen, uh, and I, I do want to mention uh, Dr. Wolf from Wolf Chiropractic and Functional Medicine, Levi Young from uh, from Levity Rolfing, mm -hmm. uh, Rally Sport, my my strength coach uh, Victoria Mitchell, and uh, again all all the folks that make it possible for me to yeah. do this, all all you know really took this thing to an, a new level. Um, uh, it will, again, we'll do it here in the shop. Shop will be open yeah. for 24 hours. and I'm going to be here taking some <laughs> shots to be sure that he will finish uh, his run. I'm going to be like, dude, it's been only 90 miles. Just 90 miles. Keep going. You just get started. Do this. All right, final. Let's wrap this up. Okay, right. I'm going to ask you five questions, Joshua. Yes. And please don't think much about it. Okay, the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. Right. Okay, one, do you have any life mantras? Never quit. Ooh, I like it. I like it. Okay. <laughs> oh, this is a good one. Don't think about it, okay? Favorite running shoe brand besides Innovate? <laughs> Solomon. Okay. Number one bucket list race? Badwater 135. Ooh, really? I, I just, I mean, I'm all about pain and I love it, but Badwater is one of those, those races that I'm like, what, what's the point? And I love physical pain. It's right. Badwater and the Barclays. I'm yeah. like, but awesome. Holy crap. Name one person, dead, alive, celebrity, musician, whatever, doesn't matter, that you would love to take in a long run. Ben Bridwell. Okay, I'm making Band of here. Horses. Okay. Band of, okay, so, musician. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, you know music, but you know more about this. My second one is former British Prime Minister Tony Blair. Oh, really? Yeah. 
specific reason why? Uh, fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating man. Awesome. Final question. You go into desert island, and you know that you can only bring one song that you can listen for the rest of your life. Which one is it? The funeral, Band of Horses. Okay. You see, he like he listens to all this crazy awesome stuff that I don't know, and I, I'm like, I need a, because I love music. Anyway, final question: favorite food or drink that you eat? You know, when you're struggling in a hundred mile race. Anything prepared by uh, Kelly Bailey Newland at Real Athlete Diets. Oh yeah. And I, I also want to say anything that my amazing, beautiful, and brilliant girlfriend Rachel Nypaver prepares. All right, I like that. Cool, man. This has been right. fun. Thank you so yeah. much for your Thanks time. Thanks so much for having me on, yeah, man. This is great. Yeah. Thank you for listening and watching. Hey, this is the first time that I'm doing this, so please let me know any feedback, any questions. Just let me know. Take right care. On. Bye. Thanks, y'all.